Please join me in welcoming him to Politics and Prose. Hello. Thank you for all for coming. I'm seeing so many friendly faces. Um, I'm going to do my best to stand in front of the microphone and speak because I have this horrible habit of walking and I'll be over there talking and nobody will be able to hear me. So um, if I do that, someone just kind of go, get back to the microphone. <laughs> I'm going to talk, tell stories, and read from this book for a little while, and then I would hope that we can sort of all talk together and ask some questions. But um, the basic story here is that this, is, this book is two stories. We starts off on one very bad day in Darfur a few years ago. And that day is sort of the critical point in my life, but also in the story. And it's what happens after that day that I think is the important part of the story. Um, but that story doesn't make any sense unless you tell the first half. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how I got to that place. And then hopefully in the discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about what happened afterwards, which I think is actually the much more interesting and hopefully more important story. Um, I joined the Army in 1983 as a private, enlisted in the Army. Um, I had one of those great non-commissioned officers that knew everything and could see the future. And he saw my future as not being very promising. <laughs> and he pulled me aside. He was one of those guys from the, like the Vietnam era, the McNamara's 100,000 guys. And he sort of pulls me aside and puts his arm around my shoulder. He was from, I don't know, somewhere way, way, way south of here. And he said, Caps. You're never going to be a good non-commissioned officer. And I was shocked because my dad was a non-commissioned officer. His dad was a non-commissioned officer. My mother's father was a non-commissioned officer. All my uncles, all my cousins have been non-commissioned officers. I just thought, oh, my God. And, he said, and I said, well, why? And he goes, because you don't have the patience to train officers. And that's what NCOs do. They lead, but they also have to train the commissioned officers. And we had this lieutenant who was just impossible, and I didn't have no patience to train the guy. So he, my NCO suggested that I become an officer because then somebody could train me. <laughs> and that happened, and I spent about nine years in the regular Army. And then I joined the Foreign Service, and I stayed in the Army Reserve. And over the next 15 or 16 or 18 years, I deployed between the Army and the Foreign Service off to a lot of interesting places. Uh, one of those was Kosovo. And uh, very briefly, I'll tell you the story that I was in a Foreign Service job in Montreal, Canada, a very beautiful place, and the work was just dreadful. And I was bored out of my skull, and this cable comes across. A cable is a State Department message. And my boss points out and said, you should volunteer for that. And I didn't know what it was, but I was ready. And I saw Kosovo, and I, I to this day, I, I, I will tell you the truth, I did not know what Kosovo was, where it was, what it meant, but I was ready to go because I needed to get away from what I was doing. Um, and this is what that was like. We were part of a team of 12 Americans, six Foreign Service officers, six military officers. And we were sent there to serve as military observers, as diplomatic observers. Uh, the unspoken message was stop the fighting, stop the killing. And we weren't very good at that because both sides were still very interested in killing each other. There's a point in every war story where the protagonist encounters war dead for the very first time. Every single war story, you'll find this. And this is my moment, so I'm going to read this to you. It's called Yellow. Yellow. Their skin was yellow. They had dirt under their fingernails and their feet were dirty. There were six of them, all women under the tarpaulin. Some of them had lived long enough to have their wounds bandaged before they died. Some of them were killed more or less instantly as shrapnel, or 7.62 millimeter rounds had entered their bodies. They'd been dead for about 24 hours. We knew this because we had come to witness their funeral, to witness and to stand a type of guard. If we were present, the Serb snipers would not shoot the family members as they buried their dead. It was the first time I had ever seen war dead. I remember being surprised that their skin was yellow. My experience with death before that day had been limited to a few funerals, a friend's older brother, my grandmother. None of them had been yellow. So I was surprised. This was the first time I'd ever seen what dead people looked like if no embalming was done, 
what they looked like without makeup and a nice suit of clothes. They were just dead. Lying in a tangle of limbs under a blue UN tarp on a trailer that only a week before had carried peppers and corn to the market in Malashevo. Only parts of their bodies were visible. I couldn't see all of their faces. One had an arm resting across her forehead. One had a bandage covering most of her head. One of the dead was missing, an 18-month-old child. We'd seen some dogs on the way up the trail. Morgan Morris, the dauntless UN refugee agency field officer who had led us to the scene, said what all of us were thinking. The dogs probably got the body. She was right, of course, but none of us wanted to be the one to say it. We'd just seen the mother resting in a house in the village a couple of kilometers away. She had a bullet in her upper arm. The bullet had passed through her baby, then through her breast before lodging in her arm. The father said the baby was killed instantly. The bullet tore the child in half, he said. He had dragged the mother away to safety. A doctor in the Red Cross was treating her wounds in a small village in the a small house in the village. There were ten women and seven and a seventy two year old man in one stifling, airless room of the house. All of them had been wounded in the attack. They sat silently on the floor, their backs against the walls of the room, lost in their pain and thoughts, waiting. What they were waiting for was one of the Americans or one of the Europeans that were part of this team to take action. They were a village of civilians in a small valley, and the Serbs had fired mortars at them, the Serbian government troops had fired mortars at them, and then swept through in an infantry sweep with automatic weapons, killing them. And there's this old man leaning against the wall with a bullet in his side, and he's looking at us, and he's wondering, I'm sure, why there's an American and a Brit standing in this house doing nothing to stop what's happened from happening again. So we went up into this valley to watch and to stand a type of guard. The villagers wanted to bury the dead in plain sight of the ridge line where we could still see the Serbian snipers. This land, they said, had been taken from them in the 1940s, and they had reclaimed it in the 70s. It belonged to these people, and they were going to be sure the Serbs understood that. The women they were burying were born in this valley and had spent their lives raising crops in its field and giving birth to their children in the small houses that made up the hard scrabble town. We parked our vehicles in plain view as a deterrent to further shooting. Certainly the Serbs wouldn't shoot at EU or US observers or the white and blue UNHCR vehicle. Nonetheless, I admit I was shaky about standing around at the base of the draw. The ground was hard and it took some time to bury the dead. The men worked with shovels and picks for about an hour to dig graves for the women. Afterwards, we stopped on the way out of the draw and used our satellite telephone to call Washington and tell the State Department's Operations Center what we had seen. It seemed a very far place away from that hillside. The officer on the line was a colleague, a classmate, a friend. Had it been someone else, I might have been more animated in my description of the scene, but Doug understood what was happening without my resorting to histrionics. Eleven wounded, ten women and one 72-year-old man, seven dead, six women and one child. Yes, I counted them myself. Yes, we're sure they were dead. I verified it personally. I left out the part about the dogs. We made one more stop on the way off the hill. An old man flagged us down as we were leaving the draw for the village and told our interpreter he wanted to show us something the Serbs had done. I glanced through the window of the house and saw a group of women sitting on the floor, rocking slowly, comforting each other. They surrounded the body of another woman. She was laid out on her back and wrapped in a blanket. Part of her face and head were missing. What remained was veiled in a colorful scarf. The man said a mortar round had exploded within a meter of his head. He held his hands out in front of his body to demonstrate the distance. The sitting women wailed in unison as he said this. He was the dead woman's father. Amid the crying and the smell and the flies, we listened to his story. Having felt safe enough in her house to remain there with her husband and children, rather than moving up with the others, she decided to take some food up to her neighbors hiding in the small canyon. 
She was at the base of the draw when the attack started. The mortar shells probably came in groups of three. Punk, punk, punk. As they left the tubes, then a breathless, agonizing five or six second wait while they flew, and finally the brittle carump, 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 barking and echoing off the walls of the canyon as they exploded. The gunners probably set the fuses to go off about one and a half or two meters above the ground, about head high. It was an awful story. I couldn't wait to get out of there, away from the smell and the crying and the death. I felt outraged and horrified that soldiers would fire mortars at women and children. I had to look away. I concentrated on the colors in the woman's headscarf rather than her wounds. I watched the other women slowly rocking. I looked at the woman's father. My partner, Rob, photographed her body and I took notes about what her father said. Then we left, eight dead. Down the hill at the intersection marking Cynic proper, a crowd of women and a few men had gathered. Some boys were sitting by the edge of the road with a wooden box filled with cigarettes, crackers, and chiclets, entrepreneurs. They sat expressionless as a small crowd swarmed our vehicle. I pushed open the door and stood pinned against the truck by the crowd as my translator echoed staccato pleas for help. One woman pushed through the crowd and held her baby at arm's length in front of me. I was face to face with the child while the mother spoke deliberately but calmly. She wants you to take her son out of here so the Serbs won't kill him, Mimosa said. I looked at the woman and said to Mimi, make sure she knows we can't do that. Say this, we're observers. We can't relocate you or your son. If we do, the government in Belgrade will order all of us out of the country. I felt feckless and impotent as the words spilled out. For the first time, I understood the folly of being in the war only to observe. A tourist among the victims. It was hot, and with the sun beating down on me, I felt cowardly, yellow, hiding behind my sunglasses. I waved my notebook at the Red Cross panel truck and said that was the vehicle that would take them to safety. I was sure the Red Cross would refuse, but I was unable to muster the courage to tell the woman and the 50 other people crowded around me that there was little hope they would get out that day with an international. I found out later I'd been wrong. Several UNHCR officers arrived late in the day, and one of them took it upon herself to evacuate some of the children to a safer village. Before we left, I went back to the house where the wounded were being treated. I had to tell the mother of that missing child we didn't find her baby. It would have served no purpose to tell her what we thought had happened. I couldn't have found those words anyway. That evening after we returned to our office, after we washed our truck, I drafted my report. It was only three pages long, no speculation, just the things we understood to have happened based on what we saw and what was reported to us. I said it appeared that a Serbian infantry unit had swept through the valley from north to south, preceded by a barrage of mortar fire. During the barrage and subsequent infantry sweep, seven women and one infant had been killed, and 11 others were wounded, including a 72-year-old man. Vehicles and clothes, food and other supplies were burned in the sweep. I said we'd seen no evidence of weapons or of any insurgent activity in the village or among the villagers. I didn't mention the funeral. I didn't mention the dogs. I didn't mention the woman begging me to take some action to save her children. I didn't mention the look on the old man's face. I carefully caveated what was told to us versus what we saw ourselves with qualifiers like reportedly and allegedly. I carefully made the people and the events in the village the center of the report rather than my own actions or my feelings. Never star in your own report. I let my teammates read the report to ensure we all agreed with it. Then I turned it into the reports officer, our editor. I had written a crisp, dry account of a messy, horrible act of cruelty. And in doing so, I had documented a war crime. I spent two years in Kosovo. I was supposed to go for two months. My boss said, okay, you can go for two months. I ended up staying two years. He was very unhappy, but it was the life-changing point for me. It, I was never the same. Um, I went from there back to Central Africa where I'd worked previously. Um, I went to Rwanda. This was post-genocide. There was still a nasty insurgency going on just across the border, and there were hundreds of thousands of people dead. We were tracking war crimes, crimes against humanity, all through eastern Congo for two years. Um, 
there were attacks into the country of Rwanda while I was there by the Intera Hamwe, although they changed their name several times. And from there, I went to Afghanistan. While I was still in, Afghan in Rwanda, the United States was attacked on September 11th, and pretty much everybody who'd ever been in the military got called back. And um, I got the call, and they said, you're going to Afghanistan. So I went to Afghanistan and was assigned to oversee the activities of a lot of people. I was getting a little longer in the tooth. And I showed up, and I'd always been an operator. I'd always been the guy on the ground doing the work himself. And I got there, and they were like, nope, Grandpa, there's your desk. But I had 100 people working for me all over the country. And um, what I've figured out over time is that just that action of being pulled back into the Army, being called back to the regular Army, away from this work I'd taken up with the State Department, was sort of enough to shake me. I'd been able to keep um, my life segmented, all the terrible memories that I'd been through in Rwanda, in Kosovo, in these other wars. I was able to sort of put under a box, stick it under the bed, and leave it there. But somehow, being called back into the Army in Afghanistan rattled those boxes enough that the, the evil little nasties started getting out. After I'd been there about a month, um, two Afghan civilians, uh, neither of whom should have been in U.S. custody, died in U.S. custody. And um, not long after that, I started having some real problems. This is what that was like. In the cold pre-dawn, I can hear generators running and vehicles moving on the other side of the base. But it's quiet inside my tent. None of the other soldiers I share the tent with is even snoring. I've been awake for a few hours, but stay in my sleeping bag, fighting the nearly overwhelming urge to run away. The Taliban have launched a couple of rockets towards the base during the week, so we're all a little on edge, but that isn't what's keeping me up. I'm bundled into my sleeping bag, trying to control my racing heart and trembling, because the dead have come to talk to me. They've been coming every night for a couple of weeks, the dead from Kosovo or Rwanda, beckoning to me, pulling me from a warm, comforting sleep into a series of wretched, tormenting, wide-awake dreams. Tonight it's the dead from a farm near the town of Podievo. Burned Bible black and twisted into hideous contorted shapes, they lie in a cold rain that falls through the burned-away roofs and pools on the dirty floor. Do you remember us, they ask? Most assuredly. The night before, it was the dead from the village of Rachak, 45 of them, shot in the back of the head and left to die in that rocky ditch on a Jan frozen January morning in 1999. They've dropped by for a chat. Why didn't you move do more to save us? They ask. Why indeed? Night after night, they appear on the big screen in my mind in oversaturated technicolor, writhing and imploring. Night after night, the murdered and mutilated come back. Each time, I'm scared and ashamed. I know they aren't real. I know they are only images in my head, but I fear them no less for knowing this. They terrify me for what they remind me of, the fighting I didn't stop and the lives I didn't save. They terrify me for what they represent, that I can no longer stop them from taking control of my mind. I lie on my bed trembling, eyes wide open, still seeing the dead in front of me. The trouble begins slowly, developing over time, and by the time I'm fully aware of it, I'm having graphic, violent dreams nightly. I wake from these dreams in a panic, shaking, heart racing, crying sometimes, always afraid to go back to sleep. I'm losing control of my brain, of my mind. In time, I even start seeing these images when I'm awake. During the day, I'm unable to concentrate. I sit at my desk or go to planning meetings for operations, shaking until I have to leave the tent and go outside to get control of myself. I fear I've lost my mind, but I'm afraid to ask for help. I fear I'll be ridiculed, considered weak and cowardly. In army culture, especially in this elite unit filled with rangers and paratroopers, asking for help is a sign of weakness. My two bronze star medals, my tours in airborne and special operations units, none of this will matter. To, be, to ask for help will be seen as breaking. But when I can no longer control the images in my head, when in the middle of the day I'm forced to hide, shaking and crying in a concrete bunker, railing against the noise and the images, when I realize that to continue to deny this would endanger the soldiers I was sent to Afghanistan to lead, I finally ask for help. So the way you do this in the Army is you, you walk up to your friend, you know, 
because you're a macho guy, right? You walk up to your buddy who happens to be the division surgeon for the 82nd Airborne, and you go, hey, you know, I'm having a little problem. There's nothing to worry about. But, um, and you start explaining. And he's giving you this, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he's looking at your weapon, uh-huh. And he's looking at your hands, uh-huh. And then he asks you the question that all Army doctors are trained to ask. Are you a danger to yourself or others? Meaning, you're walking around with a pistol and a bunch of rounds on your hip, a nine, you know, an M4 sitting over there at your desk, and you could just kind of go off on us, so we're a little worried about you. You know, we can sort this out, but you have to answer the question first. Are you a danger to yourself or others? And I, I told him I wasn't. I didn't think I was. That would come later. But I went down to see the, he got me an appointment for that day with the psychiatrist. And when I walked into the, the tent, because this is all in the early days of Afghanistan, we're still in tents. And I walk into the tent that's called the Combat Stress Center. And this is where you go if you either have psychiatric problems or you want to quit smoking. <laughs> you laugh, but it's absolutely true. If you want to quit smoking, you go to combat stress. And it's, 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 it's light cover, just in case somebody goes, hey, I saw you outside the combat stress center. You go, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to quit smoking. Uh, you don't smoke. Yeah, I know, I'm trying to keep from smoking. <laughs> you always have an out, right? So the Army's always trying to cover you. So I walked in, and um, I sat down, and the, the, the nurse was kind of giving me the, the stink eye. And um, the psychiatrist is in the back treating someone else. And I sit down, and they've got this big TV, this huge TV there up on a table, and I sit down at the chair, and Larry King is interviewing somebody. This is when he was still on CNN, and, you know, some ingenue telling us just how important it is that we all lo love and understand her. And then I look down under the TV, and there folded up on the shelf right under the television are the straitjackets. And I'm just like, Ugh! So that wasn't a good thing to see, and I just start shaking and crying and rocking in my seat, and that's when the psychiatrist walks out. And he's like, I'm sure I made his day. He's like, yep, there's another field grade officer falling apart in front of me. Long story uh, somewhat shortened. He treated me. He kept it out of my permanent medical records. And I came home. I made it home, um, brought my guys home. Uh, didn't bother taking very good care of myself afterwards, though. Um, ended up going to Iraq a few months later. The State Department, when you show up, back from some military assignment, they go, oh, you better be careful, you're going to end up in Iraq. So they assigned me to the desk managing uh, the paperwork going back and forth between the State Department itself and our embassy in Paris. <laughs> okay, I'm in this little office the size of a closet, and you know I'm sending stuff up and back to the Secretary of State, and it goes up and it comes back, and it's not good, so it goes up again and it comes back, it's not good. And this earns you looks of disdain from all your colleagues because you're a field officer, not a European officer. You know, you just can't do that work. And that was horrible. And then some friends showed up at my office and, hey, we're going to Iraq to debrief terrorists. You want to go? <laughs> and I'm nuts. I'm out of my mind. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'll go do that. So I left a nice, cushy job in Washington that people would fight for and went to Iraq, stayed there a few months. And uh, my buddy from my Army Reserve unit called and said, hey, you're about to get mobilized to go to Iraq. I'm already here. We came to an agreement um, that I would not go to Iraq. I would go to Darfur. I, again, a place that I, sure, wh where is it? I don't know. I, Kosovo, Darfur, I had no idea where these places were. I literally went to the book and started flipping pages till I found out where it was. I arrived in Darfur in the summer of 2000. In the fall of 2004, there were 200,000 dead, two and a half million displaced. And I was sent there uh, to be part of the African Union mission, and our job was, of course, to stop the fighting, and we didn't do very well at it. We had about 1,500 people in an area the size of France, um, again, with two parties that weren't very interested in stopping the fighting. And I hadn't been taking care of myself. Um, after about nine months there, I was in worse shape than I'd ever been. 
I got a call. Your mom's in the hospital. Come home. I spent a month with my mom watching her die. Um, I went back to work and was sent immediately back to Darfur. Um, I arrived and was just absolutely falling apart. I had not been taking care of myself. Off meds, on alcohol. Um, guns and alcohol are a very, very, very bad combination, if you're wondering. <laughs> um, and I was out in the desert with a whole bunch of guns and a bunch of alcohol. In an Islamic Republic where alcohol is illegal, of course. And um, I was sent out the second time initially to work in support of a United Nations mission. And this is what happens. I was in El Fasher in support of a UN mission to organize and run a training exercise for the African Union peacekeeper staff. I was the scenario writer. The three scenarios I'd written were roughly like this. A humanitarian emergency develops into a security crisis. Deal with it. A security crisis develops into a humanitarian catastrophe and includes, includes significant press interests and bad weather. Deal with it. The kitchen sink of problems arrive sequentially. Deal with all of them. The African Union staff had an officer on the UN team who helped with the details of the scenario. He had the plots and he knew the solutions and he gave these to his colleagues on the African Union staff. They still failed. Personally, I was failing too. I was falling apart, in some ways worse than I had in Afghanistan. I was deep into a bad PTSD episode. I was drinking myself into a stupor every night in an Islamic Republic where alcohol was banned. And I was carrying on a clandestine affair with a UN official. The genocide was actually diminishing, but we had no way of knowing that at the time. What I saw around me was 300,000 dead and 2.5 and million displaced. I had no real safety net to catch me nor anything during the day to hold me together. I had very few actual responsibilities since the scenarios were already written. I was mostly along for a ride with the UN team. Despite this, I was managing pretty well until one really bad day. The woman with whom I'd been having an affair for a couple of months asked me what would happen after our work together ended. We'd been going at it for a few weeks, first in Nairobi, then in Addis, now in Darfur. We're having fun in nice hotels in Kenya and Ethiopia and dodgy guest houses in Sudan, drinking, playing. But when she started making noises about next steps, that set off alarm bells in my head, dragging me back to the realization that I had a life outside that little war zone bubble. Soon I would have to go back to that life and to the reckoning. I obviously wasn't rational. Nonetheless, I was functioning at a pretty high level, writing intricate scenarios for a modern-ish fighting force operating in the midst of a complex emergency, continuing to collect information about the status of rebel forces' disposition and actions, the government of Sudan's response to the insurgency, and writing reports for the embassy about what I'd learned. At the same time, I was carrying on an illicit affair. But in my head, I was convinced that my life was fucked up and that all I was doing was hurting other people. I'd failed to stop the fighting in Darfur, just as I'd failed to do so in Kosovo and in Zaire. My writing sucked. My mom had just died. My marriage was a failure. I was a failure. Everything I touched brought pain to others. I wasn't getting better. I was getting worse. The dark stuff in my head triumphed over the rational, workaday reality. I decided to kill myself. I think I did so quite rationally. I thought about it through the morning, scripting the steps and the timing, mentally locating the tools I would need and sorting out their acquisition, thinking about the aftermath, both immediate and longer term. By lunchtime, I had a plan. By mid-afternoon, I'd acquired all the tools. Late that afternoon, I began work. I grabbed a couple of beers out of the ice box, wrapped them in a shirt, and put them on the seat of the Toyota. Earlier in the afternoon, I'd gone over to the US team house and borrowed a pistol from the Special Forces team sergeant I'd been working with. He loaned it to me, no questions asked, because we'd worked together for six months or so, and he had no reason to suspect I was anything other than a competent, professional career officer. I drove out of town to the west, somewhat dramatically, I later realized, into the setting sun towards the reservoir. I pulled off the main road to the north side, towards some small villages, just a cluster of huts, really, and stopped the truck on a low rise, just high enough to see the sun falling toward the desert. I opened one of the beers. I started crying, but I don't really know why. I was filled with a sense of failure and frustration, a sense of conclusion. Nothing I touched succeeded. Nothing I did was good. 
I'd been through five wars in ten years and done nothing to stop the killing in Rwanda, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, or Darfur. I felt as if I'd reached a logical place in my life to end it. I opened the second beer. I picked the pistol up off the seat. It felt, it felt good in my hand. I felt surprisingly deft with it. I pointed it out the windshield with the magazine resting on the steering wheel and I curled my finger around the trigger. I imagined pulling the trigger and the immediate pull the weapon would make as the round fired. There wasn't anything to shoot at out there, so I would have just blown out the windshield, but even if there was something to shoot at, I wouldn't have hit it. I was holding the pistol in my right hand, and I'm left-handed. I put the pistol back on the seat. I remember a momentary flash of clarity. Who else could I hurt if I did this? My wife, certainly. Anyone else? My sister, maybe. I thought that what I was getting ready to do would leave a hole in some lives. I even thought about someone having to clean up the truck afterwards. Maybe I'd do it outside and leave less of a mess. But the clarity passed, and I was overwhelmed with a sense of futility and sadness. I'd failed to stop the wars. So many people were dead because of my failures. Images were rushing at me, the 45 dead from Rachak, the raped nun from Bunia, the man with the red-rimmed eyes and his mutilated family near Cynic. I picked up the pistol and charged it, loading a bullet into the firing chamber. My hands were shaking. I put the beer down and took the pistol off of safe. I was sobbing, talking to myself, to the spheres, to no one. The pistol was ready. I shifted it to my left hand. I looked at it in my hand, lying partly in my lap and pointed down a bit. I took a breath to calm myself. I was ready. Then the phone rang. It scared the hell out of me, and I jumped, startled. I almost pulled the trigger, which would have been highly ironic, to shoot myself in the foot while preparing to shoot myself in the head. I looked at the phone lying on the seat of the pickup and saw that it was my wife, Maureen, calling from Washington. Was this serendipity, karma, luck, or just uncanny timing? With my thumb, I put the pistol back on safe and laid it on the seat. While I talked to Maureen for a few minutes, I stared out through the windshield and watched the sun setting over the rocky brown desert of Darfur. The ringing phone had broken the spell. After the crying, the shaking, the moralizing and justifying, the calming of hands and nerves, the intense focus on the immediate act of charging the weapon and then taking off the safety and preparing to put the barrel into my mouth, the ringing phone had pulled me back from the brink. So that day I returned the pistol to my friend, Special Forces Sergeant I'd worked with all those months. I went back to Khartoum to our embassy and I called the regional psychiatrist who was in Nairobi and said, told him what was going on. About two weeks later I was home, sent home to the United States, medically evacuated. In the State Department parlance it's called a psychovac. You're psychologically evacuated home. Um, on the way out, I wrote a cable back to the Secretary of State explaining just how badly the policy was going in Washington. I figured I had nothing else to lose. Um, I got home. I stayed in service about two more years. Lost my security clearance, so I couldn't work. As an intelligence officer or even as a senior diplomat, if you do not have a security clearance, you cannot work. I figured out that those type of little investigations they were going to run would run cost about six years. And I wasn't prepared to wait. Um, so I left government service, went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins University, and driving home one night, I figured out that I needed to do something with this education. Your tax dollars, thank you very much, were paying for me to go to graduate school through the GI Bill. Um, and I thought, well, I need to do something with this. What, am I, what happens at the end? You know, oh, I'm going to be a better writer. Ooh. So I decided that I would start giving away all of that knowledge. I was writing for Time Magazine, Foreign Policy, for the American Interest, um, and I formed an organization called the Veterans Writing Project, and we are a group of working writers who are combat veterans and who have graduate writing degrees, and we teach no cost to anyone in the, in the seminars, uh, writing workshops and seminars here in D.C. and now all over the country. And um, that was all very helpful, but I knew I still needed more help. Medi medicine wasn't really working. Talk therapy wasn't working. 
medicine, talk therapy, and alcohol weren't really working fast enough for me. Writing was what helped me find the road home. Writing really was my path home. But I still needed medical care, so I went to the VA. And this is what happens. So the old guy in front of me was using one of those canes with the four rubber tips at the base as he crept towards the hospital door. It was the last week of July in Washington, D.C. The temperature was at least 90 degrees with intolerably cruel humidity, and he was wearing a tan golf jacket that, as I passed him, I saw was zipped up to the throat. It made me even hotter just to look at it. At least he had a ball cap on, one with World War II veterans stitched across the front. Maybe that would keep the sun off his head. Like me, he was carrying a large brown folder. Mine held medical records, some service documentation like orders and award certificates, and notes from my combat deployments. It was my first visit to the VA hospital. The Washington VA Medical Center is as charmless a building as one could imagine. A big white box in the center of half a dozen parking lots that are constantly in overflow. In short, it looks like most big hospitals in any major city. And in many ways, I suppose it is. Just like any other hospital, it's filled with the sick and infirm, healthcare and administrative staff scurrying about, bad coffee. But in one very important way, it is entirely different. It is the place where combat veterans enter the system for treatments of wounds, both physical and psychological. Walking in from the parking lot, I started to feel all the familiar sensations, the stress rising in my gut, vision focus narrowed, breathing short and irregular, the memories of five wars and the images of the dead hovering just off stage. Inside the door, there was an information desk with a guy in a wheelchair behind it wearing a DAV piss cutter cap. He looked me up and down, no doubt making some sort of judgment about me. I couldn't imagine what it might have been. I, st I stammered a bit, explaining I'd come for my first appointment. My hands were shaking, so I held them down below the edge of the counter. He quietly told me where the registration office was and pointed the way. Walking through the, off, through the lobby, I imagined everyone was looking at me, thinking, look at the psycho boy, home from the war and broken. What a pussy. I felt like it was my first day in high school, and I was dressed in a bright pink tutu. I took a number and waited. The waiting room was actually part of the main lobby, so it was noisy and there were lots of people walking past. I kept my head down until my number was called. Inside the office, a woman looked over my paperwork. I'd brought some of my DD-214s, the document that details a veteran's military service showing training, awards, decorations, combat time served, and so on. Then she started entering my data into the system. She was perfectly pleasant and did a good job of ignoring my symptoms until she asked if I wanted to go to the emergency room instead of the green clinic. Maybe I should have. At my psychological screening upstairs in the mental health wing, away from the general medical patients, I was interviewed by someone new to the system, maybe a recent PhD graduate, with a more qualified, I assumed, supervisor attending. I had to detail all my problems in full. I started at the beginning in Rwanda, and then Kosovo, then Afghanistan and my treatment there for PTSD, then Iraq, then Darfur and my failed suicide attempt, and on and on through the drive to the hospital that morning, Staring at the floor, wringing my hands, I quietly described my memory loss, my unbridled fear and anxiety, my inability to control the images of the dead appearing in my head at all hours of the day and night, my weird hypervigilance issues. I even included the wholly irrational things like getting lost in my own neighborhood, going to the grocery at midnight because no one else will be there, my anxiety while driving because I can't control what the lunatic in the Lexus is going to do. At that point, the supervisor snickered. There was an ugly silence in the room for a few seconds with the only sounds being the air conditioner blowing through the grate in the wall and someone's heels clicking down the hallway outside the closed door. I looked up. The interviewer looked stricken and her supervisor quickly looked down at her notes. Shame welled in my throat and my eyes. My humiliation was absolute. Even the doctors were laughing at me. Welcome to the VA, psycho boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am happy to answer any questions you've got, either about the book or the Veterans Writing Project, or um, that's probably about it. Um,
or we can call it a day. There's a bar next door. We can retire there. Great. It's always a long one for the first one. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering what your take is on people who write about the war who haven't been in the war. I think it's great. I, I don't have any issues with someone writing about the military experience, a war, any war, no matter what their experience is. I, I, as long as it's good writing, I'm ready to read it. <laughs> yeah, honestly, um, Katie Schultz wrote a terrific collection of short stories. Um, Katie's not been to war, doesn't, uh, no one in her family went. It's just a terrific book. I, I, I don't really have any issues with it. Great. Anyone else? Bueller? <laughs> Great, thank you. Hi, could you spend just a little time talking about the Veterans Writing Project and the scope of that and sure. just uh, kind of granulize that some? Please? Okay, great. Um, about three years ago, a little over three years ago, I founded the project. We're based here in D.C. in my attic, which is about a mile and a half from here. This is my neighborhood bookstore, so please patronize the bookstore. Um, we are a group of veterans. All of us have graduate writing degrees. We are working writers, and we're um, graduate writing veterans who, yeah, that's it. Veteran, working writer, graduate writing degrees. We go off and teach um, writing workshops and seminars. We have our basic curriculum is a craft-based curriculum, scene, setting, dialogue, narrative, structure, point of view, plot, things like that, because I think that whether a poet comes to us, a playwright, a fiction writer, a nonfiction writer, those elements of craft are really important for everyone to master, for everyone to at least be able to control. And so we didn't want to say, okay, we're only going to teach poets, we're only going to teach nonfiction writers. Um, we provide these at no cost to the participants. We have s worked in here in the district, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, Iowa, Arizona, um, a few other places I'm probably forgetting. Our normal curriculum is two day, takes about two days to work through, but we also run uh, longer fiction workshops where we share work among the group, nonfiction workshops, poetry workshops. We've done playwriting um, and a little bit of filmmaking. Our website is veteranswriting.org if you're interested. We have a set of workshops coming up on August 2nd and 3rd at uh, the National Veterans Center here in DC. Any veteran, any service member or any of their adult family members can come to our workshops for free. We really want to bring the family members in because when service members first come in the military, you're sort of taught one is none. If you're by yourself, you're ineffective. Always work as a team. You're sub sublimating the self for something higher. This work as a team. And yet when we come home, the team is broken up and you go home home and your family then becomes the team. Well, that family story is just as important and ju to be told, but it's also just as important to reintegrating the service member into civil society. And so we always want the family members to come along as well. Is that helpful? Well, um, I'm sorry, there's one last point. We publish a literary journal, it's called O Dark 30, which is that time in the middle of the night when no, sa no sane person would be out, and the military just, that's when they're gonna do things, O Dark 30. Um, and it, we publish both online and in print, online probably two or three times a week. Um, in print, um, quarterly, um, and that's at odark30.org. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about how writing helped you, as you mentioned a little bit in your thing, sure. kind of break that down and clarify a little bit more. Yeah, this, the, uh, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to caveat everything that follows here with I have a degree in English, okay? So the science behind all this, I have a degree in English, the science behind all this is that um, when your brain, when you try to remember something, your brain tries to recreate the same s sequence of synapses firing as when you were experiencing, experiencing it. Well, that's great if what you're doing is walking past that Cinnabon, that evil Cinnabon place in the mall, because you smell that and you just go, ah. And you immediately turn in there. You're going to turn in. Or if you're like me and you're watching Field of Dreams, at the end when he says, hey, Dad, you want to have a catch? <laughs> it's a gut grab, right? Because the same synapses fire. Well, if you're having a traumatic memory, it's not that good. 
Because what happens in trauma, and this is the same for any mammal, whether it's a human or, you know, a gazelle out on the Serengeti, you know, if your gazelle out there in Chester, the cheetah pops up and starts chasing you, the big brain functions get pushed out of the way and you're just dealing with fight or flight. With humans, the big brain functions are what make us human, right? And so when that happens, all these big brain functions get pushed out of the way and you're still dealing with the amygdala and the limbic system, the stuff we crawled out of the swamps with. Well, if you survive this, this is an evolutionary moment. If you survive it, the big brain functions all come back. But when you're trying to remember it, when you remember that event, whether it's a physical attack, a car wreck, combat, whatever it is, your brain wants to remember it the same way. So the big brain functions get pushed out of the way. The amygdala tells the rest of the body, focus the eyes, shorten the breath, power to the back and legs and arms, release huge amounts of cortisol, release adrenaline, fight or flee. And that's called a flashback. What writing does, and this is true, I believe, for the, any of the creative arts, music, dance, drama, art, it's you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional art, or writing, you force the big brain functions back into this equation. You had to learn how to paint. You had to learn how to write. You had to learn how to type. These are not uh, things managed in the, in the limbic system, in the amygdala. So you bring that back in. And it's like putting on a glove and reaching to pick up an ember. If you, you know, if you reach to pick something up hot, you burn yourself. Some of these memories, you can't manage them by yourself. But if you use art, music, dance, drama, writing, it's like having that glove. You can reach out and you can grab hold of it and you can shape it. And once you hold it, once you control it, it's yours. And I've got a little sign, a little handwritten sign up in my attic. It says either you control the memory or the memory controls you. And I just got sick of the memory controlling me. And I used writing as a way of getting control of those memories. And through repeated exposure, just by writing about it over and over and over again, I'm starting to own it. You know, there's a part in this reading that I do every time, and I never know where it's going to be, where all of a sudden it just, I'm there, and I get that gut grab. It happened early this time, and I, I got through it. But sometimes I still don't own them. They, they still can reach out and grab you, me. So that's how it works, and that's how I did it. I just kept writing until... You know, I ended up with this book. And so this, when I say that this, this is my road home, it literally was the way I found my way home. Does that answer your question? Very much so. Thank you very much. Ma'am. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Has your writing and your work at Walter Reed with the Veterans Writing Workshops been able to have any effect with how the VA looks at psychological trauma? <laughs> um, well, the work we do at Walter Reed is the Department of Defense. And so DOD and VA, never the twain shall meet, although they're trying. Um, the VA, up until very recently, didn't, uh, didn't seem to me to be interested in what are called complementary and alternative treatments, which are things like writing and yoga and acupuncture and petting the dog and things like that. But just in the past year or so, they have opened at big VA headquarters and at five centers around the United States complementary and alternative offices and on Monday two days from now I'll start teaching at the VA hospital here in DC so fingers crossed we'll see how it works the work that she's talking about that we do at uh, Walter Reed the National Endowment for the Art, uh, Arts again your tax dollars at work has a program at Walter Reed in a, a research center there that's called the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which is DOD's premier research and treatment facility for PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And instructors from the VWP have been going up there since January of 2012, so for two and a half years, every Wednesday, to work with traumatized, wounded, very badly damaged service members. And I got to tell you, it's the best day of the week for all of us. And so we're up there right now. Every Wednesday we go up and work with uh, service members. We're also starting to work a little bit more with uh, staff members because, boy, are they going through a lot up there. Yes, sir. Well, you've talked a little bit about some of the uh, destructive uh, influences you had when you were overseas. And you also talked a little bit about reintegration. I'd, I'd like to focus on reintegration. You're, Obviously, you had some startled response, a lot of hypervigilance, all that stuff, and, and a lot of folks around you, when you start doing that, and when you, when you act that way, think you're nuts. That coupled with the damage you did to your family unit and everything else you did, how have you gotten over that part of reintegration? Obviously, the writing is helping. 
but how do you stop the startle response and the hypervigilance? I know you don't, but to explain how you handle that and how you help put your family unit back together if you could. Um, I think uh, time has been really helpful for me. I've I'm back on medication, tried to get off it this year, went back on after about six weeks. Um, my family has been very supportive. My new wife, very supportive, very pa patient, <laughs> patient, very good, um, very understanding. Um, one of the most important things, and I said this um, on NPR the other day, and somebody called in and they were really struggling with this idea that I talk about at the end of the book called moral injury, that you've got to forgive yourself first. And once you've done that, then you can move on. And I took very seriously the taskings that I had in Kosovo and in Darfur to stop the fighting, to stop the killing. I didn't do it. And I took very seriously, obviously, my failures to do that. Was that rational? No. Could I have stopped a war? No. You know. So I've had to sort of move beyond that. Once I've moved beyond that sort of self-loathing, that anger at myself, um, I think all of my symptoms have gotten a little easier to manage. Um, the repeated exposure of writing, I think, um, has been incredibly helpful for, for me. There are still days I haven't written about. I, I don't know if I will. But it's time and repeated exposure and just coming to understand that I could not have stopped that war. Late in the war in Darfur, when I, late in my time in the war in Darfur, I broke the chain of command and went outside of it and got away from my general and called a friend of mine back here in Washington and said, look, if we don't take action, this village called Mahajaria is going to go away tomorrow. Tomorrow, all those people are going to die. And I knew that, you know, either I'd get an ass chewing or those people would be alive the next day. Those people survived. My friend took action. The Assistant Secretary of State called the Director of Programs or the Operations at the African Union. That morning, the next morning, the African Union deployed a platoon of Nigerian peacekeepers out there. That village survived. And so I can point to small successes like that. Lots of failure, okay, the occasional success. That's what keeps you going, you know. Um, and I've just had to try and move beyond it. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. I'm so glad that some of us will have the chance to hear you in October for the Fitzgerald Festival, for which I have flyers. But I wanted to, um, this was very moving. Thank and, you. And I don't, I'm, I was trying to think, I want to move toward literature, of another book, another war book that has even two wars in it, to have <laughs> such different wars in different places, um, not male or not anybody that we can think of who writes war material has such an overview, but I'm wondering where you take your models in w this vast, I can't think of anything other than love that is more documented in literature than war, and do you have particular models or particular favorites, or do you think anybody's done it particularly well? Um, oh, I think lots of people have done it extremely <laughs> well. <laughs> um, you know, this, it's, a, it's a huge genre. You know, some of the earliest writing was about war. You know, look back at the Iliad, the seminal war story. Um, you mentioned Mailer. I mean, look at what J.D. Salinger wrote about his experience. If you want to read what post-traumatic stress disorder is like, go get Salinger's book. It's up here called Nine Stories. And in there, there's a story called For Ask Me With Love and Squalor. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be his experience. I think it's... So many people have done it so well. I don't think that I consciously sat, well, I, I know I did not consciously sit down and go, I want to write like this mm -hmm. person, um, because that's not how I started writing the book. Um, the storyline on how I started it was 
I said early on that I wrote crisp, dry accounts of messy, horrible acts of cruelty. That wasn't enough for me. I would write these State Department or military intelligence reports back to Washington. And that wasn't enough. I needed to say more. I knew there was more to say. And I wanted the rest of that, the remainders, to be documented. I wanted the names of oh, those 45 people killed in Rochark. I have them all. I have all their names. I wanted that to be documented. I wanted the smell and mm -hmm. the taste in your mouth when you walk into a place where there's no painkiller and there's no antibiotic and that smell of sweat and hatred blended. I wanted to be able to document that. So I would go back and finish my reporting for the day and then I'd go sit down in my tent or in some rented room or on a, under a tree somewhere and I'd write the remainders. And that's how all this started. You know, I sat down in Kosovo in 1999 and I wrote the words yellow. Their skin was yellow. And that's, you know, 15 years ago. So that's how it got started, was just me trying to document the rest of this. You really started a genre. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> but thank you. It's very generous of you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I have a couple of questions. But one is... Um, have you taken some of the, the truths that you've learned about writing with soldiers who are in active, du active duty? Um, and also, I've just heard uh, a little bit about what you do with leaders, or, or a at least saying that it's leaders, some of the leaders that you met in the field who weren't very helpful, and you gave some of those stories uh, today. And so have you reached out to work with some of the, the managers, the leaders, uh, the generals, you know, as far as how they could be more helpful in referring rather than, um, you, you know, causing further humiliation. I've tried. Um, when I was writing for Time Magazine's military blog that was called Battleland, um, I wrote pretty regularly about the use of the term post-traumatic stress disorder. My thinking on this has completely evolved, and I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> totally in another place. But the vice chief of staff of the Army, a four-star general named Pete Corelli, was just death on the, the use of the term disorder. And he, I'm, I'm not in the same place he was. I've now gone in another direction, but I'm not where I used to be. And I said that it's leadership, not lexicon, that's the problem. It doesn't matter what we call it. It's that every leader, from corporal to four-star general, has to just get beyond the fact that this is mental health. It's health care. You know, I'm in an airborne unit, and if you broke your ankle on a jump, people pointed at you and laughed, but they loved you still. They, they were like, okay, dude, come on, we'll pick you up. You get your, your, your leg bandaged up, you get a cast on, you're going to be in the S3 shop making PowerPoint slides for the next few months, and then you're going to come right back to us, and you're going to jump with us, and you're still going to be with us. You still get to wear the, red, the, the, the maroon beret. But if you go in and say, hey, man, I'm struggling with PTSD, you're broken. We don't want you as a part of this team. There was a guy in a special forces unit at Fort Carson, Colorado. His, he told his commander, look, I, I need some downtime. I can't deploy again. They charged him with cowardice. This is a staff sergeant in the United States Army, charged with cowardice because he needed some downtime. He got out of the military. We, America, lost this soldier. You know? And so it is leadership, not lexicon. I, I've written that a number of times. Um, to my knowledge, two general officers have come out and said they had tr struggled with PTSD. One was a guy named Carter Ham. He's a four star, formerly the commander of U.S. Africa Command and later the commander of U.S. European Command. Um, actually, Carter Ham re reviewed my book for Army Magazine, um, said nice things about it. And the other was a guy named Gary Patton, not related to the Patton, but another line of the Patton family. And he came out as a major general, I'm sorry, as a brigadier general, talking about his experiences as a colonel. So he'd been promoted, and he got promoted again. So we're seeing some movement, but it has to happen at every level. It has to be the corporal, the sergeant, all the staff, non-commissioned officers, lieutenants, captains, everybody all up and down the chain just have to get beyond this. And I guess the second point really is that there's a huge shortage of psychological health treatment professionals in the United States, whether the civilian 
Department of Veterans Affairs, or Department of Defense. We don't have enough. We need psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers all across the board. We need them. We don't have them. So I would say that that's the message I've been trying to get out, both in the book, on all the press that we've been doing, um, and when I was writing for Time Magazine. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. I mean, but partly, I'm just wondering, is writing useful when people are in, in service? I mean, you're working with folks who are out and... And we're so forth, we're working with active service members up at uh, Walter Reed, but that's a very small group. Um, I, 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 I think writing, art, I any of this, the sort of complementary alternative stuff, you, people self-select. Mm -hmm. I, I want to write. So they go and write. Or, I, I'm really you know, going to play my guitar. I'm going to learn to dance. Roman, uh, Roman Baca is a former Marine sergeant who started a dance company. And he's out trying to get people to understand how mm -hmm. that activity, just any sort of creative work. People have to self-select. Um, one of the things right up front we say in all of our workshops, in all of our seminars, in our curriculum called Writing War, A Guide to Telling Your Own Story, we're not doctors. If you need help, go get it. We'll be here when you get back. That said, this is what I did. This is how it worked for me. And I'm happy to talk about that. That's good. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it.